this. Okay, let's move into what I think might be the most uh, fun part, which is what would you do if it was your eye? And, and real concise answers here, guys. Let's start with this. You're 45 years old. Your pressure's 25. You live close to uh, an ophthalmologist or close to an SLT, let's say. Uh, what do you... What treatment do you want to start with, Justin? Uh, maybe nothing. Do I have any OCT loss or visual field changes? Anything at all? No, I, normal hmm. OCT, normal visual field, pressure 25. You say OCT is normal? Sorry. Both are normal. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd sit on it. I'd watch it. Lori? Uh, I have extremely thin corneas, and I probably have a really low hysteresis, so I would probably elect to treat with SLT. Mike? Yeah, same as Lori. I would treat with SLT. I've got family history of glaucoma. Okay, now we've got a little bit of red on that OCT or just a little bit of thinning. Justin, do you change anything? At 45, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna do SLT. Lori and Mike, same thing as what you did before? Yeah. Yep. Okay, yes. so you do the SLT and uh, you get one millimeter of mercury decrease from it. What do you do next, Mike? Uh, how long has it been? Uh, that was a year afterwards. All right. I'd repeat it. Repeat the SLT. Yeah, okay, Lord. That's a great thought. I would consider that as well, but um, probably be looking at a drop that won't change my iris color. Ooh, and it's okay, tell me more. <laughs> um. <laughs> this makes me sound really vain, but I have like hazel eyes. And so if anyone's going to change to brown with the prostaglandin, it'd be me. And I don't want to lose my hazel eyes. So I have patients that say this all the time. So, and I don't want to do Timolol either because I have a super low blood pressure. Like if I stood up right now, I'd probably pass out. But, um, so I'd probably do, I don't know. I might try bromonidine or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And that just goes to show how much better doctors women are than men most of the time. <laughs> because I would guess that most of us with that defective Y chromosome wouldn't, you know, think about this nearly as much as we probably should have. Justin. Yeah, I'd consider repeat, but it sounds like it wasn't very effective if you only got, you know, a millimeter, I think is what you said, a mercury drop. So I'm probably going to a drop and to your point, John, I would do a PGA, and uh, that sounds like a bad decision right now. <laughs> oh, Justin. Lose. Yeah, for sure. Okay, great. So now fast forward. Instead of being 45, you're 68. Same story. You've got a little bit of change on your visual field. You're not on any medications. You do have an early cataract. You're not on any meds. Uh, Justin, what are you doing? Uh, I mean, I want to know how uh, concise, I want to know how uh, much the cataract's bothering the patient. If there's visual complaint for me, I add a drop and- yeah, I, don't mind, I don't mind my vision. It's just that sometimes those headlights at night bug me. Yeah, but then I'm moving it. forward. I'm moving forward with cataract plus MIGS. I'll start a drop and then cataract plus MIGS. Stents in my case, to be specific, I would recommend stents plus cataract surgery. Okay, Lori. I would do the same thing, but I'd probably want to pair viscodilation with a stent because I just feel like I would need a low target. <laughs> I, I, I would do uh, I would do cataract plus goniotomy and an eye dose because uh, I'm not on drops, you said. So I'm conscious of insurance and worried about not getting coverage. So I'm going goniotomy. Plus I don't. And, and so do you, let me, I'm going to push at you for a second, Mike, because I agree with Justin. I do stents and cataract surgery, and I'm probably not doing an eye dose yet. Um, I, want, but, I want really low pressure like Lori, and I don't, I want to ensure that I don't need to add a drop back on. Keep going. Okay, sounds good. And so why not, you know, I think that one of the things that I like all, you know, presumably this is optometrist watching this podcast what I want is as much freedom to use the treatment that I think is best. So do you think that the better treatment is a goniotomy in that scenario? Or do you think the better treatment is a stent? And I would say that I think the better treatment is a stent. And so I would want them to be put on a drop so that I do have all of my options so that the artificiality of the insurance reimbursement world doesn't dictate what the right treatment is. Why do you, 
before I answer, I'm going to ask you a question. Why do you feel st stent greater than goniotomy? Uh, the safety profile and the high quality data that exists. Yeah. And, and so I, I don't disagree with you. Um, I think both do would you be great. Agree with me? Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Well, I don't want to agree with you. Well, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I, the, I the, beautiful, the, beautiful, the beautiful thing is, I mean, they're, they're, they're so close in their safety profile and they're so close in their effectiveness, um, that you can't go wrong. And, uh, I would just Can wanted I have to another give, thing? I wanted to give a different answer than Justin. Can I, can I give another angle to this? Cause we're, you know, again, nice pun as optometrists watching this podcast and you're talking to your patients. I think the other thing is by jumping to a goniotomy, I always think about this for you, John, is I don't want to remove other options for you down the, down the road. And if we strip that drainage system, I've, I've removed the option of probably you putting stents in. I mean, you could, you'd have to find a different part of the angle, but by doing stents first, now I know down the road that you could come back and do a goniotomy in between the stents, or you can remove the stents and do it around there. And so I, I always think about it as how long, how many treatment options can I preserve for the future for that patient? Less about efficacy and which one's better or not better. Um, they're probably equally as good, but what's the right order to do it to preserve more options for my patient in the long term? I just want a bigger straw in there. I want to get that <laughs> defective TM out. Yeah, sounds good. Now, Lori, you went, you said you figured you needed in particular a low pressure. Is there any reason why? I presume it's around your low blood pressure. Yeah, I just feel like I'm set up for NTG. So I'm actually just hoping you're going to cure NTG by the time I'm 68. But Got um, uh, yeah, super low blood pressure, thin corneas, migraines, ray nodes. I got it all. I'm like the textbook. So I feel like I'm going to need a low pressure. So to quote Paul Singh, who says he's always going to hedge his bets, I think if we're in there doing a stent, I'd want to go ahead and flush out that outflow system with some viscodilation, I think it's a nice thing to pair with stents and you don't really um, eliminate any downstream options like Justin was saying. I'm, I'm going to push on you a little bit, but I, I'll i come back and uh, step back from my pushing back in a second. Are you doing that more theoretically and philosophically or are you doing that more evidence-based? I mean, I'll admit, it's more yeah. philosophical. Yeah, we don't have any data to support that really. I mean, we know viscodilation can work for several years um, and we know stents can work for several years. We know that most of the resistance is at the trabecular meshwork, but not all of it. And so full system yeah. flushing makes sense. And, you know, I feel like sometimes people use evidence based as a weapon to make other people feel bad. And that's not the reality of it. And, and, it, and so how I think about it and when we train our fellows, we talk about the decision that you make really boils down to what would you do if it was your eye? And that's why we're asking the question this way. And, and our job is to take the evidence, our experience, our ability to think what, what makes sense and put that all into what's right for that one patient. So there isn't evidence that covers every situation. And you've got low blood pressure. Well, they didn't sort out people that had low blood pressure and Raynaud's in these studies. And so we have to make these judgments based on, um, based on all this stuff. Let's go to angle closure. You're 40 years old. You've got a narrow angle. It's got some PAS. You are Plano. What do you want? Justin? That's a tough one. I mean, the Eagle trial, as Lori referred to earlier, would be remove it and move forward. But I don't think at that age I would want that. So I would prefer an LPI. Okay. Lori? I think the – can I still accommodate? Am I in readers? You're 40. You're 40. So, 40, yeah, you can so, still accommodate. But it's okay. going along. Yeah. So – I think most of the time, as long as you're under the care of an ophthalmologist or an optometrist that's monitoring your OCT and your angle, 
angle closure can be kind of caught and intervened on at the right time. So if I just have some PAS, I think LPI is reasonable to wait and see um, what the angle does over time. But yeah, I, I would hate to lose that accommodation just for some PAS. Like those are technically, okay, they're not harmless because they're impacting outflow. Um, but if they aren't too broad and extensive, I think I would probably just hold off. Okay, Mike? But yeah, I'm taking that lens out. I'm putting in a multifocal IOL. I'm having you do some gonial sinecule lysis and and probably popping in a couple stents because we're in there and I'm living the good life. I can sleep at night. I don't have to worry about <laughs> pressure spikes, PAS. I've fixed two problems uh, very safely. Deal with right. deal, baby. That's right. All right. Okay. So now, Justin, you're a plus four. Same yeah, I'm going to carry yeah, Lori oh, plus four. four. I'm going Mike's route. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that. I mean, it's a great chance to get yourself some free refractive surgery right there. Minus four. Same. I'm still yeah. going to answer on that one. Okay. Plano, age 55. Take the lens out for me. Yeah, same cool. here. I mean, that's Eagle Trial. I believe everybody was 50 or older. So, um, yeah, hands down. Okay. So I think that what we've all agreed on is that the, well, not all agreed. Mike didn't agree and I didn't say. But uh, the if you're Plano and have accommodation still, it's not a no-brainer. If you aren't Plano or you've lost a combination or accommodation, take out the lens. So I think that that's where we're at. Now, uh, let's go back to that 55 year old Plano, whatever, minus one. What lens are you having, Justin? Uh, any any visual field loss or anything? Is this glaucoma or is this just narrowing? This is, this is mild glaucoma. Keep in mind, mild glaucoma has damage to the optic nerve, but no visual field loss. So no visual field loss. Um, any implant is open for me. So, you know, for me personally, because I've had previous refractive surgery and I would do light adjustable lens for me, but uh, any ah. implants open in that case, in my mind. Okay. Lori? I think I go back and forth daily on this. I just had a conversation with John Gertz in Omaha yesterday about what lens we would pick for ourselves. Um, assuming that we're kind of curing my disease by taking out my lens and that my glaucoma is not going to progress, I would... I'd be tempted to do panoptics, but I have also had refractive surgery. Um, so LAL would be on the table as well for me. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, echoing what those guys said, but um, to be different, I'm going to go, I would do trifocal. Good news. There's studies out there that show patients with mild glaucoma, uh, as John mentioned, no visual field loss. They do really, really well with these trifocals. They maybe have a touch more glare and maybe don't get as much near, but they still get really good range. And uh, a little teaser, we're doing a study uh, across some of the Van Thompson sites asking patients, patient reported outcomes, how much do you like your selection of your lens, Was it, whether it was a toric, LAL, multifocal, whatever, in these patients that also had glaucoma surgery at the same time. And so we'll know more on that once we get that data and we'll certainly share it, but uh, in general, yeah, these people have lots of options. It's great. I would also have a trifocal for sure. You know, current currently that'd be the panoptics for what's available currently is what I would have in my eye. And I think that one of the keys is like you like that philosopher Yogi Berra said, predicting the future is easy, being right is hard. And I think that the key piece, if you're gonna even start to push the limits on some of these technologies, is having a surgeon that can do an IOL exchange. Uh, you know, safely and with impunity. And so I think of it like uh, you're giving a shot, giving a patient a shot at the vision they want to have for the rest of their life. And if you don't even give them that shot, that's that's probably a miss. And so we as surgeons have to be able to do an IOL exchange and be willing to do it, especially if we're going to push the limits on the technology a little bit. Um, okay, uh, you got bad glaucoma. You've had cataract surgery, you've had MIGS, uh, maybe you've had another MIGS, you're on full drops, things are getting worse, you're 75, your pressure is 17 and getting worse. Lori, what surgery are you having? 
Uh, Zen. Justin? Zen. Mike? Um, yeah, man. I, I'm kind I'm, of thinking I'm, micro pulse. Uh, micro pulse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> non, non invasive, see what we can get. Uh, and if it doesn't work or I don't get to where I need to, then I still got Zen tube in my back pocket. Okay, great. I'm doing a Zen. What, uh, if it was me, what if that pressure was 13? Does that change your mind? Lori? Yeah, if I'm progressing at 13 and we're really confident of that, I would probably sign myself up for a trabeculectomy. Justin? I'd probably still try a Zen, educate the patient. I'm going to watch you really closely and on the horizon is probably a, a, a more aggressive surgery. Tuber trap. Mike? Micropulse? Do you yeah. call it micropulse just because it says Mike in it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm probably doing the same thing, and I'm also starting to look real hard on what future treatments are coming and what other lifestyle things I can do because pressure of 13 is hard to get a lot lower uh, to make it worthwhile, and so I'm checking out what else is available. Yeah, and when you look across the MIGS literature – MIX devices don't consistently get you below 15 or 16, typically. And that makes sense because there's episcleral venous pressure as a back pressure. And so, so really, they don't work as well in normal tension, glaucoma or glaucoma that needs to be kind of in below 15 or 16. I don't mind trying it because some patients do get better than that. But um, I don't, I'm doing that to give them a shot at a safer surgery. Um, any other, what would I do if it was my eye questions that you guys have that you think would be helpful to the optometry listening community? I, you know, we didn't what touch much on the exfoliation. Okay. Um, and, and not that it, you treat, uh, have different treatments available for it, but man, pseudo exfoliation can get really bad really fast. And so that's where, you know, being aware of it, identifying it, treating appropriately and treating early really makes a difference. And I think with all the glaucomas, just early treatment is, is key early intervention. So these people don't lose any function. So let's just talk about that for a brief second. Pseudo exfoliation, you know, in the upper Midwest where we practice, where it's pretty homogenous um, and there's not a lot of African-American glaucoma, it's a little easier to treat glaucoma because African-American glaucoma is harder to treat. That said, pseudo exfoliation can be very difficult to treat. And that's, we have a lot of that up in our neck of the woods, especially because of the Northern European populations. A couple of thoughts. One, Mike, I couldn't agree more that the real goal that we have in glaucoma is make sure people are sighted when they pass away and that they've lived a visually full life. That's our goal. And so towards that, um, MIGS may buy us 10 years, may buy us two years, may buy us 20 years. But the longer we can push off doing more aggressive surgeries, the better. And in particular in pseudo exfoliation, because those annuals are weak a lot of times. And when you change those flow dynamics, you can see that lens moving all around the place, coming forward, being in a different position. And so even though pseudo X is aggressive, I really don't like doing aggressive glaucoma surgeries in them, even though we have to, because their lens isn't stable. Agree. I think you mentioned the lens moving around, the vitreous can move around too, uh, which is even more of a pain in the butt, in my opinion, is if the you, you do a beautiful trab and there's vitreous in the AC the next day. So yeah, I think earlier intervention is awesome in those folks, but um, you know, we know that pseudoax gets even harder as you get older. And um, those really elderly folks, 80s, 90s, that walk into your clinic with high pressures, it's really hard to stomach signing them up for a big incisional surgery. So Mike mentioned micropulse. I think, thank God we have uh, non-invasive cyclophotocoagulation for that age group. And, and I've used it several times in that situation. Yeah, and one of the things that's interesting in, for cyclophotocoagulation and I don't know, do you do ECP, Lori? I do not. I, I mean, I will occasionally for a plateau, but I don't routinely use it for pressure lowering. 
So I, I, it's not particularly satisfying to me when I do the surgery. I, it, it's cool to look at, but it's not really satisfying. So we did a study combining ECP with stents and it worked better. And I, I was kind of, you know, if I was being real honest, subconsciously hoping it wouldn't work better. So I didn't have to use it anymore, but it did work better. And I like that for my patients. So we use it a fair amount. One thing that's really interesting is you see all that pseudo X debris on the ciliary body and it doesn't absorb as well. What I'm interested to know is if an externally applied cyclophotocoagulation <laughs> isn't affected by that debris that's over the top and is more effective in those situations. And by the way, you don't have to be mucking around underneath the iris close to the lens. We're gonna move on to post-operative care and 